Okay, I believe for us, maybe for y'all too, if you've got an agenda, we're going to flip over to the other side of this. Uh, we're going to do the uh, fiscal year 25 budget kickoff. If you can flip over that, and it'll say fiscal year 25 budget kickoff. Uh, 1A, oh, wait a minute, remember I've got crazy glasses. Okay, 1A. Uh, the CIP update and financial overview, overview is mid year. Yes, sir. Hey, how you doing? Doing well. Good afternoon. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, got hard copies for you, so um, we'll get those passed out. Um, Mr. Chair, um, board members, appreciate y'all having me back. Um, I'll wait for a minute until uh, until you get your hard copies here to, to dive in. But you know, this is kind of the continuation of the process we started, gosh, I don't know, six, seven years ago, the annual CIP process. Um, and you know, similar to what we've done in the past, we'll have a quick recap of where you stand currently in terms of your, your credit standing and your uh, good financial overview, including the past year. Um, and then we'll transition into um, the, the proposed CIP and potential funding plan um, tied to that CIP. So um, starting out, uh, page numbers in, in the bottom right corner, um, you all uh, established your credit rating back in 2021. So uh, that was in conjunction with uh, making middle school financing. And, and you know, that credit rating for the county is very you know, similar to our, our, in our personal lives, our credit score, right? That's what lenders are looking at to determine the, the credit worthiness of the county and if they want to lend you money and if so, at what interest rate, right? And so the better your credit rating, the lower interest rate you have, the better access to borrow money if you choose to do so. Um, county is rated AA2, AA by Moody's and Standard & Poor's. Those are the two most common nationally used credit rating agencies. And that's a very good credit rating. The, you're in that AA category, which is the second highest category. And you are two steps away from the highest possible rating of a AAA. So, so you're in very good shape here on your credit score or your credit rating. Um, you have access to the market to borrow money if you choose to do so at attractive interest rates. And as we go through the process, like we've done in the years, over, over the years, look at developing a funding plan, we want to keep in mind how that funding plan could potentially impact the county's credit rating. Not that you should make decisions solely based on, on your credit rating and potential impacts, but want to make sure we understand the potential outcomes of any, any funding plan on your credit rating. That's one consideration in the process. So we'll go through a little bit of information on that along the way. Um, and, and to put some perspective around some of these key things that we'll look at, we're going to compare you to other counties rated um, similar to you all. AA1, which is one step higher than you, AA2, which is your current rating, and AA3, which is one rating slightly below you. Um, and we're going to look at all those counties nationally with those credit ratings and within North Carolina with those credit ratings. So give you a little bit of perspective on that. And folks always seem to find this interesting. Um, in the bottom right corner here, um, you can see uh, the North Carolina counties that are rated and um, what categories they, they fall in. And so you can kind of see some of the names of the counties that fall into your category and, and the one right above you just for perspective. Okay, and then ju just as a refresher um, on page five, as you're as you're looking at those names, uh, 
what goes into that credit rating, right? And we know we have a very good credit rating, but why and how could we improve it? Um, the rating agencies have, have methodologies that they use. They publish these methodologies. It's a, it's a pretty transparent process. And we summarize those for you here on page five. But I think the easiest place to talk off of is if you look at that top left corner, Moody's Investor Service. What do, what do they look at? What are they focused on when they're developing your credit rating? It's four factors. Um, number one, economy. That makes up 30% of their factors for your credit rating. That's things like your tax base, your assessed value. Um, that's things like your, your income levels of the county um, and the county GDP, gross domestic product. Those are some of the things that they look at there. Um, financial performance, so your fund balance. Are you adding to fund balance or are you spending it down? Um, you know, are you, do you have a balanced budget where revenues are equal to or exceeding expenses, those type of things. Um, that goes into that financial performance category. That's 30% of the overall rating process. Institutional framework is 10%. You're going you're gonna to have a, a double A or a good score there because you're a county in North Carolina. That's their standard score for counties in North Carolina. And you know, there are other states where counties have a AAA or a very good score. Um, and, and that's just a function of as how North Carolina is organized. You all as a county have to fund um, school capital. You've got the DSS requirements and other mandated services that you have to provide, which are a little different than other states. Um, and then finally, the last thing they look at, the uh, remaining 30% is leverage. That's a fancy way of saying your debt and debt obligations. So that's your existing debt outstanding and few other liabilities like your pension and, and other post-employment benefit liabilities that you have to pay out in the future. Um, so th that's kind of the, the four key areas that are focused on by the rating agencies. And I think we've talked about this in the past, but I think it's worth noting, um, you really only have direct control. You all, as a board, through the budget process and actions that you can take this year, really only have direct control over about 60% of that rating, in your financial performance and your debt, right? Um, economy, certainly. You could put you know, policies in place, you can encourage and, and support and fund economic development initiatives, but that's more of a longer term impact, right? There's nothing you can do as part of this budget process immediately to change things like income levels and, and tax base, things like that. So I think the, the, the message here is, which you've done and done very well, is focus on the things that you can control and continue to do well in those as you've done in the past. Make sense? And you all feel free to interrupt me and along the way and make it conversational. Um, I prefer that, actually. So, uh, so just quick summary here on page six, looking at that financial performance side of things that, that, that we talked about, that 30% of the rating. Uh, I think it's interesting to look at it graphically. The top left graph is comparing your expenditures, which are the bars, the dark green and the light green, that's your operating expenses, and then your transfers out for things like capital. Um, those are the bars. And then the gold line over top of that is your, your operating revenues, um, your revenue piece, right? And so what you see is that that line is, is above the bars in every year, right? That means that your revenues, your annual revenues coming in, have exceeded your expenses going out. You have a balanced budget. And in fact, um, you are doing a little bit better than Right? So your budget is structurally balanced and you're creating surpluses every year. Um, in particular, right, the last three years have been very, very good for you all. And, and you know, one of the major drivers of that is the, the sales tax performance. Right? It started back with COVID and the unknown about what happens to sales tax in particular during this shutdown, you know, how does that impact things? Um, but, but you all, like a lot of places around the state, saw the exact opposite, where that just did way better than was expected. And, and the conversation 
with a lot of folks around the state has been, you know, we've, we saw double digit growth in sales tax during the COVID year and the year following. How long can that really continue? You have to budget that conservatively because it's a very economically sensitive uh, revenue source and you can't count on double digit type growth every year. So this very similar trend on the sales tax side that you all have seen, that we're seeing around the state, um, as folks are, are having to budget conservatively, expecting that growth it, to slow in the last three years, it's just really performed very well, which has allowed you all to increase your fund balance levels um, nicely over the last three years with those surpluses that were generated. And you say that's what you're seeing across the state. Yeah, I mean, that's a very common theme that we're seeing around the state. And um, I'm Lori may, I'm, I'm getting out of my lane here, Lori, Lori may have other thoughts on this, but kind of what we're seeing from a lot of folks now, um, it's only four-ish months in for the sales tax distributions that we've gotten, but starting to see that growth appear to be slowing down a little bit. Um, you know, more in line with the one to three percent type growth um, it is kind of what we're seeing around the state now so it seems like what people have been planning for the last three years is maybe starting to materialize this year but all in all structurally balanced budget done a very nice job with that adding to fund balance this just underscores what the rating agency saw with your very strong financial performance um, and, and, and related to the fund balance, you all you all have um, an informal policy there that you all have established. That's something you all kind of talked about, um, and staff tries to to track, but do not have a formal fund balance policy at, at, at this stage. Informal policy target is has been um, in that 25 percent range, um, and you can see that graphically um, in the top left slide the red line is that 25 percent informal policy the dark green line is your unassigned fund balance that's applicable to that policy level that unassigned fund balance that's your rainy day funds that's your free funds available for emergencies or opportunities or for spending and that's what your policy is tied to that's what we typically recommend policies are tied to. Let me ask you a question, if I may. Yes, sir. Uh, how many counties in the state of North Carolina has 85 percent fund balance, undesignated fund balance? Well, well let's so, so let, let's put it into perspective. Um, and this is as of 23. The peer comp on the right hand side of the page. So if you look at that right hand side of the page. This is this is as of fiscal year 22 data, so it doesn't it doesn't include your fiscal year 23 results because not everybody has their 23 audit done yet. So we're focused still focused on 22. If you look at the dark green bars down at the bottom, those are the North Carolina rating medians, right? So that means that's that's the average of each of those rating categories. And you can see it ranges from you know 25 to 35 percent there. Um, the blue lines are the range of the data, right? So not a, that's the average, but some are higher and some are lower. So you can see the folks there, that blue line in that double A two category, um, your rating category. Somebody was you know close to the 60 percent level. Um, which is which is right where you all were at last year so you know folks you know see a lot of folks in that on the higher end in the 50s 60s and with the performance last year going up even higher than that uh, but it's it's certainly you have available fund balance and that's part of what we were we wanted to talk to you all about today and if you remember part of what we talked about last year in funding the CIP um, so, let me ask you something yeah I'm curious, you know, more historically, how has our fund balance, you know, kind of related to our budget? You know, go back 10 years, 20 years. Have we historically been 50, 60 percent, 60 percent? You see the last three years, what I'm, my point is, the last three years we've, you know, obviously elevated pretty steeply, but I'm curious that 10 years before that, Mm -hmm. I, don't have the, I don't have the data with me, but we've definitely not had highs like we have the past three years. Right. These have been abnormal times. And as you'll see when I get my talk about my presentation, things like sales tax are definitely 
component right there. Yeah, and, and you can see on this chart here. I mean, since 2020, I mean that uh, in a lot. What you're saying back there, 19 and 18. That's a lot like the line was the 10 years prior. And then you can really see 2020. That's when it exploded. But, and I'll, I'll move on. But like, have we ever been around the 25 mark? You know, it's an informal yeah. procedure. Yeah. Right? Yes. <coughs> but it, it has been a while. I mean, it's several years back. Yeah, I mean, we probably were closer to 25, 30, 35. Yeah. And, and what I'd say is, is related to that, right, um, there's a lot of factors that go into how much fund balance you may want to consider carrying. One of those is the size of your capital improvement plan, right? When you're doing things like the middle school project and some of the projects we'll talk about this year, um, you have to have some cash flow on hand because even if you're planning to borrow money to fund a project, you have to get to the point where you have your bids in hand to borrow that project. You have to ca be able to cash flow, preliminary site work, design, all of that. You've got to have funding to cash flow before you can borrow and reimburse yourself for that. So what you often see is as folks are ramping up on a capital improvement plan, fund balance tends to stay a little bit higher above their policy to allow them that room to, to cash flow those expenditures. So that's one consideration. Um, I do want to point out, and I think this is important, back from back in 2021 um, from the rating agency reports, uh, the bottom right corner, the last sentence, S&P said that they could raise the county's rating if economic metrics improved or if the county were to formalize additional financial policies and practices, everything else being equal, right? So you all have improved your financial performance from 23 as we saw. Um, you know, to the extent, we, I know we've talked about it over the years, but you all look to adopt some policies as part of the budget process. Next time we talk to the rating agencies, I think that would be a very favorable factor for us to potentially try to push that rating up to even the next level, you know, one step away from the highest level. What type of policies? So, good, good question. Uh, first would be a fund balance policy, um, which you've got an informal policy. We, we'd suggest making that a more formal policy. And we've got some language for you on that on page eight. Um, if you choose to do that as part of the budget, some just some sample language, suggested language we recommend. And, and as part of that, you know, one of the questions will be, well, what levels do we establish, right? You know, do we, have, do we establish a target, like a minimum level? We don't want to fall below this, but we want to target something higher, or do you just want to establish an absolute minimum? I think, you know, the minimum and the target is, is a good way to go because you say, look, you know, we don't, we're not going to fall below this level ever. Like that's that, that's not we're we're not going to go below that level. We're going to target to be at this higher level. But anomalies occur, emergencies, opportunities that allow you to kind of pull down from that target level um, and still be above the minimum. So I think it just provides a little bit of flexibility in the policy. Um, last year we talked about potentially looking at something like a target of around forty percent. So, you know, minimum perhaps of this 25% consistent with your current policy, targeting something perhaps a little bit higher, and at least in the near term as you fund capital projects. And if you look at that, the chart on the bottom left, you can see based on 2023's um, results, if you were to have a 40% target, line four, 40% target, um, that would be a, a policy requirement of right at $25 million of fund balance and unassigned fund balance. You all are currently at 45 million. So that gives you about $20 million of excess funding that you could consider utilizing as part of um, a capital funding plan if you chose to do so. That amount was $15 million last year. So that's been an improvement, part of that financial performance that we talked about. And um, one of the things that, that we often see in policies and that I think rating agencies really appreciate, um, highlight this language for you if I can, it's, it's um, in that second bullet item, 
B1 and 2. Um, so, so if you um, have a fund balance target, right, anything in excess of that target may be drawn down for non-recurring expenditures, right, the most typical of which is capital projects. And the reason why we think that's important is, is going back to that financial performance, right, maintaining a structurally balanced budget. If you're spending fund balance on recurring expenses like personnel, salaries, fund balance is a one-time revenue, right? You blow through that 20 million over a couple of years and all of a sudden, you've still got that expense level, right? You increase salaries, you added a new service that you're paying for every year. That expense doesn't go away, but that excess fund balance does. You spend through that and you don't have that revenue source anymore. So that's why we typically say, and I think the rating agencies appreciate, focusing excess fund balance on one-time expenditures, again, which is commonly capital projects. And so that's something you'll see as we get into the CIP funding plan, just like last year, we built that into the CIP funding process, um, assuming that if you were to move forward with these policies, that would be the most likely use of the additional fund balance. So it's not sitting on the dollars that you've built up, using them for the funding program um, and bringing them back more in line with lower levels, um, but doing so as part of your policy and in conjunction with a policy. I think that just provides a lot of folks like rating agencies, like lenders, and probably everybody in this room some comfort that, that yeah, we built up a nice fund balance, we're spending it down, but we're doing it smartly in conjunction with our policy that we recently adopted. So the state recommends 20%. Is that still accurate? Yes, the LGC. Yeah, their target. They, their target, and it's typically based upon what they typically do is they look at a, a different type of fund balance, um, but it's it's the average of your population peer group is what they typically look at. Okay. So, so it's slightly, it's a slightly different calculation. Their calculation is more of, I don't know, Lori, you're I'm over my head, more of like a, an accounting-based um, uh, assets and liability type calculation, whereas you know the unassigned fund balance is kind of just looking at your your cash flow, the, your your fund balance that you actually have on the books available. Yeah, the performance indicators that we have to do every year started a few years ago. Auditors fill part of this out, and based on the, the input from the audit, then it spits out some numbers. So um, the median fund balance available as percentage of expenditures was 39 percent for our group that they throw us in. So that ties back into the target of 40, maybe, but not dropping below 25, which sticks historically with what previous several years of boards have stuck to. And then, of course, the minimum is the 20%. And so in that, and I know you said the uh, sales tax was one of the biggest drivers for this fund balance, but um, would that not be, um, if you do that consistently over the last three or four years, I mean, you can see the graph is going up and up and up and up. Um, and that's, um, would you not offset the taxpayer's liability with these revenues? Yeah, it, it's certainly that, that that's an option, right? Once you get to the point of identifying, you know, what the new level is, right? Um, and I think one of the one of the things that that has been good, and that you you and others around the state have been able to add to fund balance and and, and have that cushion build up some cushion, um, but has been challenging from a budget budgeting perspective, right? Is because you're seeing double digit sales tax growth, but you can't budget for that every year, right? Because right. So what happens is in 2020 you have double digit growth but you actually budgeted for a decline in sales tax given what the League of Municipalities and the Association of County Commissioners are right? So you got a big spread there. But when you go to do your 21 budget, you, you see, okay, we're not seeing that, right? It's, it's actually doing better. So you set your 21 budget based upon what you're seeing in 2020, 
and then all of a sudden you have another double digit growth in 21, right? And so it's that's kind of been the trend over the last few years. So now in 24, you set your budget based upon how you normally would somewhat conservatively based upon fiscal 23. And if trends continue with this lower level of growth in sales tax that we're seeing, you should come in much closer to budget. You're not gonna have as wide of a gap. And so now you've kind of plateaued and now you've kind of reestablished, all right, our new level of sales tax is around this level and you're kind of balanced out at that point and that all just gets built into the budget process at that point in time. So it's it's an annual process, an annual decision for you all, right? But in periods of intense growth, very high growth, you're all you're tracking a year behind and you gotta wait until it plateaus before you catch up. Thank you. Yes sir. Real fast. If we have some minor like formal policy changes to be made to improve our credit rating that's all it takes. Could you make us a recommendation and maybe this board take it up, take up some kind of action during this budget? If it's just clerical, you know, verbiage. Yeah, look, there's no guarantee, right, that that improves your credit rating. But they did say that would be a positive factor in, yeah. in, in the process. It and seems I, like it's so simple. It's something yeah. that could be really easy to put it in the budget. I, th I think you should. I do. And you I can mean, help us. you can yeah. provide us some recommendations. Right? Yes, sir. Absolutely. We can coordinate with Derek and Lori on that. <laughs> yeah. I just would like to see what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Just put it out there, and then if it's, we if it's that simple, it. we yeah. talked about it last year. We can get draft policy share it with y'all to look at. Like I said, we can probably adopt it as soon as the March meeting. Yeah, it can be done in a separate document as a standalone financial policy document, or it can be adopted and, you know, as part of your budget document as well. And that way, it, we see it both ways. Um, I think there's pros and cons of each. You know, doing it in the budget means you're looking at it every year, right? And you're thinking about it, and are these still the right levels? Are these still the right policies? Um, so we'll coordinate and maybe put together a recommendation on how best to bring those to you. Yes, sir. All right, we're transition into to some debt stuff now, unless other questions on finance? Okay. All right, so just real quick on your existing debt, right? This is kind of one of the baselines that we look at when, we're, when we start talking about the CIP. The financial performance, that fund balance is one piece, debt is the other piece, right? And, and you all currently have about 22 million of outstanding tax supported debt. Very low level for, for, for your size county. Um, you're in good shape there. Um, most of that's tied to the Macon Middle School project. And, and I think one of the important things that you see is, is over the next five years, you have these significant step downs in your debt service levels, right? So that's gonna be providing an opportunity as part of reviewing a capital improvement plan, there will be natural affordability for capital and or debt service as your existing payments decline. Right now you got three and a half million dollars that you're paying, but by 20, 28 it's two and a half million and then it's one and a half million in 29 right so those are some pretty significant dollars that are being freed up just within your existing debt profile and that's what over the years as we've been doing this capital plan that's what's really helped fund some of that future capital and then back to the policies right um, there's a couple of key debt policies that we recommend um, the first is called the 10-year payout ratio, right? What percentage of your principal outstanding and your borrowing amount, your debt outstanding, are you repaying over the first 10 years, right? And so the idea there is um, establishing a policy. Typical range is in the 50 to 60% range. I think 50% is the most common. And that's saying we're gonna repay half of our debt over the first 10 years. That's just ensuring that by policy, you're not going out and taking on a bunch of debt, but not paying back principal. You're just paying interest on it. You're not paying down your debt and you're just pushing all of it out to future years for future boards, future taxpayers to have to deal with. You're just kind of managing along paying the interest piece of it. That's the idea of this payout ratio. It ensures you pay it back 
in a responsible fashion. Um, you're in good shape here. You're at 80%, going to 100% over the next 10 years. I've, policy recommendation is probably going to be at that 50% level. You'd be well in compliance with that. Um, and you stack up nicely to the peers on the right hand side of the page. So you're in really good shape here. The second key ratio that we look at is debt to assessed value. Debt as a percentage of your tax base. Property tax being the largest revenue source for counties in North Carolina, measuring the debt you have outstanding against that property tax base. You all are uh, you know, less than 0.2%, 0.2%. Policies are typically in the two to 3% range. So you're a fraction of that. And you can see if you look in that peer comparative on the right hand side, you're below all of those medians and kind of right in line with the lowest point of the North Carolina counties. So that's when I say from a debt perspective, compared to the size of the county, you have very minimal debt outstanding um, compared to others. You're in good shape here. So that would be part of our policy recommendation. And then the last piece on 13 is debt service to expenditures. Your annual debt service payments, so not the total amount of debt outstanding, but what do you have to pay every year as a percentage of your budget. It's another measure of your debt burden that the county has, but it's also a measure of budgetary flexibility, right? Because if you issue debt, and we're gonna do fixed rate debt, we, that's what we've done in the past, that's what we would do in the future, those payments are locked in. We can tell you what your payments are for the next 15 to 20 years on all your debt. And you gotta pay that, right? It's not like, you know, you can't furlough a debt service payment, lay off a debt service payment, turn the lights off early. You really have no control over that piece of your budget, right? So that's, that's where it's a measure of budgetary flexibility as well as your debt burden. Typical policy range in that 15 to 20% range, um, you all are right under 5%. So a fraction of typical policy ranges that we see. And again, on the right side of the page, you're, you're at the low end of all the North Carolina medians and all the North Carolina AA rated counties for that matter. Um, on the national side of things, I should have mentioned this on the other page too, the light green bars, that's national counties. I mentioned this earlier, right? Institutional framework for North Carolina is lower than some others. You, can, you have to fund schools, right? Well, in other states like South Carolina, independent school districts exist, they have their own tax rate and they issue their own debt to fund school capital. So you lose some comparability here and this is, you know, this is what we see, right? North Carolina counties tend to have slightly higher debt outstanding, debt service to expenditure ratios than national counties because of some of those other increased ob funding obligations that you all have. So all in all, compared to these policies, again, bring those back to you for recommendation, you're in really good shape. You have debt capacity. That's what that's what we typically refer to as. You have capacity to take on additional debt as part of funding a CIP if you choose to do so. Otherwise, you're still in really great shape, and it provides you a lot of flexibility going forward. <coughs> Related piece of that, right, is is affordability that we've talked about over the years. What are your what does your cash flow look like? What do you have available to pay for capital going forward? And this is that really small chart that I know y'all love. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, I, I won't go into, I, I think we, we've talked about this a couple of times now, but just high level reminder here, and this is why I use my iPad so I can zoom in. Um, the left hand side of this page is what we call your capital funding requirements. Your existing debt service in column B, Column C is a placeholder for proposed debt service. And then columns D and E are your pay-as-you-go, cash-funded capital. And, and this is just your on your existing debt and your existing obligations right now. So we've shown what how you budgeted 24 actually. And then going forward, we have your existing debt service in column B. We know what that is to the penny in future years. And then column E 
is your annual allocation for pay-as-you-go capital. This is something that, that you all put in place um, a number of years ago as part of the CIP. And it establishes a baseline minimum for planning purposes. A million dollars for county pay-as-you-go capital. $1.15 million for school pay-as-you-go cash funded capital. And $600,000 for, for vehicle and equipment funding. So that's what makes up that baseline $2.75 million. Now, that doesn't mean you're spending exactly $2.75 million a year on cash capital. That's for planning purposes. When we get into the actual CIP, start to identify projects. Some years are a little higher, some years are a little lower, but you're spending and be able to budget that, that flat amount every year. There we go. Um, all right, so then, then sort of the middle part of the page is the revenues that are available um, for funding capital. <coughs> Column G is, is a, your fixed budget transfer for capital, fixed budget set aside for capital. That was set aside, gosh, I don't know, five or six years ago. It's just over $2 million. Um, column H is restricted school revenue. So these are the lottery funds and the restricted school sales tax dollars. So these are, they have to be spent on school capital projects. And, and to date, you've had ample school debt service and ample pay-as-you-go capital, that 1.15 plus million, to, to spend all of those restricted revenues. But you know, as, as your existing debt service declines, as the making middle school debt service is declining every year, um, there may be there are future dollars available um, from those restricted revenues. And then um, column I is that the budget for those pay-as-you-go right projects, same thing as column E. That's you've set that amount aside in your budget. And then column K is kind of a, a hodgepodge of some other revenues, uh, partner revenues. People, you know, some of the towns have agreed to. to pay a share, their, their share of certain debt obligations, as well as, and this goes back to Ms. Cheryl, about what you had talked about earlier, excess sales tax. So this is a planned use of excess sales tax. We use this for pay-as-you-go capital, right? Because we, we don't know that we're going to have an excess every year, and we can't budget for it, but we also don't want to ignore it. So we're planning to use it, but tying it to one we plan to use part of it and tying it to one-time capital projects allows you to say hey we didn't get that excess last year we need to slow down on some of those capital projects <laughs> um, so all that sums up into column L revenues available and then column M is tracking the annual surplus deficit column F versus column L right total requirements versus total revenues and right now you're in a surplus mode, right? We haven't layered in the CIP yet, right? So it's your existing requirements. You're in a surplus mode. You have debt affordability, right? You have dollars available to put towards the, and I should, I should call it capital funding affordability, right? It's not just for debt, it's for capital as well. Um, so you have dollars available every year. You also have some capital reserve dollars that you've built up over the years. Um, that balance is just under $5 million right now in the capital reserve in column N. And right now, because we haven't layered in that CIP, we're just assuming those annual dollars dedicated to capital are just building, can you continue building up that capital reserve. It's not gonna work out that way, right? You're gonna have to continue funding additional capital projects. But, I mean, I think this is all in all, a showing what we talked about in that credit rating, right? You all have done a great job of managing yourself over the years. You've set yourself up with dedicated resources, have limited debt outstanding, and have the ability to consider funding capital projects if you choose to do so. We we'll transition into that capital now, so <laughs> jump in. Questions? Uh, all right. So, capital improvement plan. I think y'all know the drill, right? Derek, Lori, um, coordinate with department heads, send out capital funding requests, departments send in 
their capital funding requests on a, on a on a standard form that that we've used over the years. All of those forms, all those initial requests are in the appendix. That's why the book's so thick. Um, so you can look at those initial requests. Derek and Lori get together, review those requests, talk to us about the affordability and the details, um, and kind of adjust those requests and plug them into years that you know are, are, are make sense in terms of, of the sequence. And what you see here on 16 is the draft of the capital improvement plan as adjusted by management and finance. Um, in total, it's $180 million. So if you look at column B, in total, it's a five-year CIP, fiscal 25 to 29. That's what you all have historically adopted. That's you know, the common time frame for CIPs. In total, it's $180 million. And, and of that, two major capital projects at this point, both are schools. Um, it's the Franklin High School project that we've talked about, 127 million. And then Highlands Middle School project right at six million. Doesn't include the Macon Middle School track that you were talking about. Those dollars, like Lori said, are already been sort of, they're there already. Um, and that project's the kind of continuation of that prior um, project. So um, those are the two major projects, right? And that makes up 130 million of the 180 million dollars. But importantly to note, and congratulations, y'all received the, the needs-based public school capital fund, a lot of letters, grant um, from the state, which is funding $62 million of the high school project. And then there are some additional funds that have been received and set aside to be a, to go towards the Highland Middle School project. So, you know, total of 62.9 million goes towards those that 133 million of, of major capital projects. So it leaves you with a net funding requirement there for those two projects of 70 million dollars. Similarly, um, lines eight through through 13 show sort of what we call the re recurring or, or other typical CIP, right? These aren't the big major projects necessarily. They're the ones that you're looking at every year and having to do. Um, line nine and 10 are those annual school and vehicle allocations, 1.15 million and 600,000. And then line 11 is, is the other county departments, right? That kind of at minimum is gonna be a million dollars a year. And then there's some other additional school projects um, on top of the annual recurring allocation of about 650,000. So when you look at that, that's the 47.7 million of sort of normal CIP projects. But again, some outside resources that you all have available, have received to be able to go towards those projects. Um, so 25.6, 0.2 million of the 47 million is coming from sources other than county revenue, county funding. Um, so leaving you a net amount of 22 and a half million, right? So in total, we've got the 180 million CIP. When you look at it, it's a big number, but when you break it down a little bit, 48% of that is funded from resources outside of county resources. So, I, I mean, very enviable position to be in from my perspective, from what I see. So, you all, CIP, um, again, 180 million, about half of that is funded from outside resources, county funding requirement of just over $90 million over this five year horizon. It's part of the process, right? Um, projects are identified and, and over a 10 year period. And a lot of times what we see is the requests come in, everybody, year one, everybody wants their projects done in year one. But the reality of it is it's a 10 year period. And we do summarize future years there in that gray header. Um, those are things that have been requested or maybe being considered down the road. They are not part of the funding plan and the CIP that we're looking at today, but those are things to be aware of that are out there in the future. Um, and, and the biggest piece of that um, are some of the other major capital projects that have been requested with the Senior Center um, and the Indoor Fire. 
And to, uh, I mean, it's just to add to that, the projects that with the first blush of this prioritization from administration and finance, if you'll notice, uh, aside from our, what we would call other or recurring uh, CIP items, um, things like with the schools, the Nantahala wastewater, that's something this board has been discussing uh, and talking about correcting. With Southwestern Community College, that is the, uh, we have received 1.4 million in bond funding for that project previously, so a lot of that money was offset. Um, it also includes a, an SEC project that the county is only responsible for a $100,000 match on. So that project is reflected in there as well as our, our commitment to that. So the projects we stuck in there first to be able to do to move forward with the two major priorities, which were the uh, Franklin High School project and the Highlands Pre-K. Um, the, the remainder of the priorities outside of those that you would count regularly or recurring, um, nine times out of ten had funding sources tied to them or they were something like the phase one of the rec park like this board has discussed moving forward with it um, with the pickleball tennis court complex at 1.7 million just because we have uh, this is something that that board has discussed but we can certainly um, this is uh, this board's uh, prioritization but that was just that's kind of what guided us as we did this first prioritization for you um, and I think, you know, to, to that point, right, part of the thought process was leveraging off of outside dollars that were available to get as much done as you can. Um, all the details, right, uh, Appendix B has a summary by project. I'm not going to walk through that today, but Appendix B has a summary level by project. Um, Appendix C looks at some identified operating impacts of capital projects, right? We are focused on the capital side of things, the capital funding side of things. However, there is, you know, an op a whole other operating budget, right? And sometimes things you do on the capital side impact the operating budget. So that's part of the request for departments. If you're, if you have a uh, capital project, or is there an operating impact tied to it? We summarize that in Appendix C, and then um, Appendix D is that all of the detailed project sheets um, submitted by departments. Okay, a little more detailed summary on 17 that I, that I won't get into. Um, well, let me just say this too. Um, the, the, the other piece on back on page 16 that I didn't want to mention, sort of when you look at the sources of funding, right, we talked about 48% of that is coming from grants about uh, a little over 10% is coming from pay-as-you-go capital um, and reserve funding. And, and that's probably something that we may look at as, as part of the policy recommendations. A CIP will be part of, of a potential policy. And you're looking at trying to maintain somewhere around 10% of funding on a cash basis, that's something we often look at, right? We don't want to just fund CIP with all debt. We don't want to. We don't want to just rely on debt for everything. We want to make sure we've got a, a good, at least 10% component funded with cash. Um, and then um, the remaining amount, about 40%, is funded with loan proceeds tied to, you know, the Franklin High School and uh, the middle school renovations. It's on that uh, projected cost here of these uh, in capital projects, that's the principle we're talking about. Yes, sir. So when you do the interest to go into our debt service or into our debt limits, that's computed into it, the interest. What is the current, what's that? I, I, you couldn't team me up any better. Let's flip forward to page 18. We'll finish up what I just said. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Let's get to page 18. It's got your, it, this is how that debt layers in both the principal and the interest component. You and in the later. bottom right corner, you on, the, you later. <laughs> on the 70, do I? You can pay me later. I, I will. I will. Yeah. Uh, on the 72 million of, of new debt, um, plus interest at a 5% interest rate assumption, which is a little conservative in, in today's environment. Um, it, it works out to be 108.5 million total payback, principal plus interest. So bar, the 72 million for projects plus interest results in 108.5 million of total payback, principal plus interest. 
Okay. And, and you can see right in the top graph, these are your payments. These are the principal plus interest payments. And, and they, are, they are jumping up at the beginning, right? But we also talked about having that decline in your, your existing debt that, that provides some relief. Um, one of the things that, that we're gonna do is part of this um, funding plan is we're going to bring in $20 million of the excess funding. Right, we're going to bring that into the funding plan. Last year we had used the 15 million at that 40. Remember, at 40 percent, you had 20 percent excess. Last year it was 15 million that we brought in. This year it's the 20 million that we that we're bringing in. That is helping to manage the these step ups in debt service. Right, that can help pay for pay as you go capital projects and and can be used um, for one time spikes in debt service. Right, so. When you look at this, the first three years, as this debt comes online, jumps up to its highest level, and then it comes down very quickly from there. So, kind of, kind of call it shaving off the peak of that debt surface, right? Um, and 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 so that's part of the use of that twenty million dollars coming in for the capital program. Now, the difference in the current debt service and the projected debt service. Is it pretty broad? It's five or six million dollars. Yeah, your current your current debt service again, right? It was three and a half million dollars, and you're kind of under these assumptions. You peak out at ten million dollars. So on an annual budgeting process, that difference of six or seven million dollars, how's that generally accounted for in in, in an annual budget? I'm going to show you coming up. It's part of that capital. It's part of that cash flow analysis. I'm not moving quickly enough for you. Um, all right, uh, just real quick on 19 debt capacity, right? We talked about that, the ratios of policies. With these new projects in this $72 million worth of debt, you would still be above payout, higher is better on payout, and lower is better on debt to assess value and debt service to expenditures. You would still be better than those typical policy limits and any policy level that we would look to set. So that amount of debt is within that debt capacity that we talked about. And then page 20 is your that debt affordability analysis. This is where it comes into that budgeting process, right? Um, and so what we've done is we've layered in column C, the proposed debt service, and we've layered in um, column D, the additional pay-as-you-go capital funding, right? These are the amounts over and above the $2.75 million of those annual allocations. And you can see it's, you know, it's kind of front-loaded there in 2025 with a pretty large amount of pay-as-you-go capital that's you know, partly exacerbating some of those increases, right, that we see by debt service. But at this point in time, we've made no changes to the revenue assumptions. Nothing updated on these revenue assumptions. The only change that we've made on the right-hand side of the page, over in column N, we brought in that excess fund balance, right? It was at $5 million. We're assuming that if you go with the policy route, you bring in that excess over the target level for capital projects. Um, and that's consistent with what we had looked at last year as well. Um, just a slightly higher amount given the fiscal 23 performance. And when we look at that, right, there is um, the revenues are slightly lower, or, or I won't say slightly, just revenues are lower than, than expenditures, than the requirements in column F for um, about a seven to eight year period of time, right? Where, where the debt service spiked up and where we have that higher level of capital spending, right? Additional capital projects over the annual allocation, we're using that, that $20 million, right? A fund balance. Uh, we're using that, um, some of that, to help shave off the peak. But by doing that, there is no additional revenue required. You can manage that step up in debt service, the increase in pay-as-you-go capital, 
with the existing capital reserve plus the additional excess fund balance. You, right, so you're starting out with between your existing capital reserve and the excess fund balance, uh, just under 25 million in the capital reserve. The minimum amount it gets to in 2032 is $7.6 million. After that point, you're back into an annual surplus mode of your annual revenues being higher than your annual expenses. And so there is cushion in this plan, right? There is, you have the, the 7.6 million, and then after that, there's additional dollars available. I think, and taking the lead from Lori and, and her good fiscal strategy, we try to be a little conservative, right, in this. There's no investment earnings factored in, right? So you're starting with a $25 million balance. Right now, you're earning five plus percent on that. We're not factoring in any of those earnings. Um, I think we have uh, very reasonable and, and conservative growth rates on sales tax of 1%. You know, hopefully you outperform that in the long, long term. There's more dollars that are available there. Um, and then on the fixed transfer to the general fund, uh, from the general fund, for, for debt service and the fixed pay-as-you-go budget, we're not growing those dollar amounts, right? So if your tax base grows, if your other sales tax and the general non-restricted sales tax grows, we're not counting on any additional dollars being available to go towards this plan. So I think there's room to improve long-term, but we try to be conservative and have an achievable plan without having to count on some of those items because you know we know it could have a bad year and and we want to have some conservative is a conservative nature in there you know I mean, what we saw the last couple of years inflation is real and and can be bad in certain years so project costs may increase and so we've got some cushion to manage that by with these conservative estimates you know but overall you know you're funding the $180 million CIP, about half of that is coming from resources outside of the county's budget. And for the remaining $92 million, you're able to cash flow that with your existing resources that you've dedicated to capital, plus the excess general fund balance that you've built up over with the overperformance over the last several years of sales tax. So, I, it's kind of an enviable position from, from where we've been in prior years, right? Where um, particularly when we didn't have that grant, you know, we were seeing, you know, large tax impacts tied to the funding of the high school and the other capital projects. That's no longer there. Um, and, and you know, you're, you're able to farm this without any new dollars. A lot of folks we're talking to and looking at, there's impacts needed to, to, cash, to cash flow capital projects. Mitch, yes, sir. And I hate to make this really simple. I just feel like we just received $62 million. Okay, we have $30 million thereabouts that I'm comfortable using of our own money, $90 something million. Can we not have some kind of a pay go towards this high school instead of funding $180 million in this balloon and, and racking up the interest that Mr. Higgins talking about? Yep. It's $92 million that buys us a year, two years into the project as a debt service you know, decreases, and then we have a quarter cent sales tax that's a potential. I mean, what about that scenario? Yeah, absolutely. We can we we can we can look at those different types of scenarios and test how how, how does that impact the future, right? How does that impact your future capacity? But certainly, if you wanted to take some of these dollars and put it towards the high school, I mean, even within this plan, right? You've got seven point six million dollars. If you were to say, look, I don't want to, I don't want to end up with any excess any cushion in this plan at a minimum you take 7.6 million and and put that in and that would then you would end up with a little bit of excess because you would save on some of that interest so we can look at we can look at different scenarios and we'll if you choose to move forward with this plan fund these projects you know that's part of what we'll do is hey let's let's so let's try to balance this out are there other better scenarios, but this is kind of just the baseline scenario that we know you can fund it, and so now are there ways to improve upon that? Another thing I think, Mitch, like, you know, you look out here in uh, 26, 27, and you've got uh, 
1.6 million in in airport projects. That's assuming those projects go. That's assuming those projects are funded. That that that, that, that money funded, would be there. I don't so think they, that's the net. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that's the net. that is yeah. the net. Yeah. yeah. So that's 700 and. Uh, and eight that might not be there might not and, and like many projects some of these projects they might not happen in these five years so that's going to impact that bottom line number on that as well and my I think, point is I just wouldn't mind to see a comparison if we went pay go bought us two years without having the interest from a hundred eighty million dollar loan well you're going to have no, we're talking about a 70, 72 million dollar loan. Um, you don't have to borrow for the full amount. The sixty million you get from the state, and you borrowing the difference, right? So it's seventy two million of borrowing. Right. Right. Um, but part of the other issue is, and I think Laura, you jump in here, but I don't know that you would want to not borrow the money when you sign the contract to fund the project, right? Um, Lori has to sign a pre-audit certificate and and the, the conservative approach to doing this is, hey, if we're gonna sign, if we're gonna build, um, you know, a hundred and twenty-seven million dollar project, we're gonna have our funding in place to make sure we can pay the bills on that. Because look, it happened in COVID for a several month period of time. Markets can shut down. Like can we still collect interest on those funds? Yes. Funds? Well if we allocate hundred twenty seven million dollars and put them to the project, the project doesn't use yes, the funds we'll earn interest. or draw an interest on the money. Yeah. And then you get into arbitrage, though, because of course right now we're in a high rate environment. <laughs> yeah, so right. Right now, you borrow that money right now. You're in today's market. You would be call it three and a half percent range on your interest rate on your on your earnings. No, on your interest payments, about three and a half percent. Your main source of investment, the Capital Management Trust, is earning five and a quarter right now. So there's no real cost to carry. Um, so I think it's uh, from multiple perspectives, right? I think you're safer having the money in hand up front, right, to be to make sure you can cash flow the project. The LGC would prefer to see it, and right now it, there's no real cost of carrying those extra dollars, right? You're, you're, the dollars that you buy and invest are, are earning more than than what you're paying on the debt. That can change, right? That can change overnight. We're talking about, Fed's talking about multiple rate decreases this year, and so that will impact that short-term sure. earnings rate. But I think you're in a good environment now um, to move forward with, with the debt financing for the project. I mean, it's we're not at our lowest of low interest rates, um, but you know, last year at one point we saw rates spiking up towards like the five plus percent range. You're back down to around three and a half percent. So you're in a good spot in the market, um, and at least right now there's no cost to carry. Um, but that said, we'll look at we'll look at other options and see if there's ways to do to to take advantage of that and use it more efficiently. Um, the other thing that I would say on that to play into your decision-making process on that is kind of going back to the CIP, right? The future years, right? You know, we know there's a couple of major projects that have been identified. Maybe other projects that you all have in mind that, that may be important, you know, in, after the next five years. If you don't use that cash to go towards one of these two projects right now, you're able to hold on to that for longer. And if we outperform these projections, which is the goal, right, um, that sets you up to be able to fund those other projects in the future with cash, where we don't know where the interest rate environment is at that time. It could be much higher, could be lower, but you're in a known rate environment now that is a good rate environment. You can take advantage of that, lock it in, and save future dollars for other unknowns for future projects. So those are just some of the things that, that for y'all to consider as you're making that decision. But we can certainly look at other scenarios, and depending upon where interest rates are, we may find that there's a, a break-even point where, you know what, using 
10 million dollars to go towards these projects ends up at a slightly higher cash balance than if we borrowed it all there, there there's some break even point there that, that we might find sometimes we find that that every dollar that you add for cash you end up reducing that fund balance over on the far right side so we'll play around with that going forward if this is something you choose to move forward with. so um, based on all these numbers and figures and everything else in the current budget that we had for 23 24 going into 25 budget um, how much money after all of this do we have left for expenditures do you have any information on uh, not on the total because, operating budget no, because i have uh because i guess the question through all of this is we're talking about high school and the highland school and a few things uh, coming up but uh, and i'm not sure exactly what all is uh, hiding around the corner for the school system but uh nanahaven school wastewater treatment plant make middle school track iola school water issues highland school soccer field highland school expansion franklin <coughs> in that franklin high school sports complex the new school the cte the higdon property we're looking at five million east franklin school i'm not sure nobody's talked about that any longer um, SCC is seeking uh, funding, uh, funding for the armory, funding for liability or library repairs, senior center parking issues, Macon County Jail plumbing issues, maintenance department needs additional funds for repairs, courthouse repairs, the fire alarm system at the courthouse, Macon Middle School sewer gas, uh, Macon County Rec Park, and the courthouse square. Um, none of these. Um, I mean, because it seems to me like we're talking about spending 20, 25 million dollars of this fund balance on two projects, um, and this county needs a lot of attention. And what are we going to have to do to get this money? Are we going to have to raise taxes to get there? I understand we can build this school with no tax increase. I, I knew that from a long time ago. But to fund the rest of these projects that's, that's right around the corner, and those are just things that I know about. Where are we going to come up with the money to do that? Well, a lot of those, John, about 60% of them are included in here. Um, for other projects, again, what Mitch is up here telling you right now is that we've got, is that Macon County, and Mitch, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that Macon County is in the financial position right now that in the next fiscal year, we can spend $146 million in capital improvements to this county. We can do that and, and we can spend $180 million over the next five years. And we can do that. We can do that without, uh, without raising the taxes. We can do that without ever falling below $30 million in the fund balance. We can do that without ever falling below $7 million in our debt reserve fund. But going back to that, those are just numbers. These projects that are incorporated into this plan outside of those that are regular recurring capital expenditures, that's just your limits, what, or that's just the, the bookends. What goes between those bookends is up to the county commissioners. Um, that's who that's who establishes and, and sets these bookends. And, and all those projects you mentioned, like I say, 60% of them have been included in here. The the uh, roof at the jail, the roof at the library, the courthouse security panel, the uh, uh, the uh, rec park phase one of the of the parks and recreation plan all that's been included in there the southwestern community college fire and safety training center that you mentioned that's included in there um, HVAC package upgrades for county facilities that's included in there yeah, so true. so all of these the Nantahala school wastewater treatment plant that's included in there in the 1.8 million allocation in 25 there so uh, like I say, 70% of the things that you just mentioned are in here. That other 30, all these are at the end of the day. And, and the reason that we chose the priorities that we have to get started with this plan is, from an administrative standpoint, is number one, the Franklin High School project and, and Highlands Pre-K and discussions of this board we felt uh, and actions of this board through appropriating the architect fees to, to continue moving forward in this budget with Highlands those are what we felt were top priorities. So in putting those in there, 
we had to do a little figuring on the other priorities and move some stuff out. <coughs> Center Center. That was a $25 million expenditure. We had to move it out of that five-year time horizon. You know, we might there might be a few more things that you mentioned that aren't in there, but like here in 26, like we mentioned, there's a $708,000 requirement uh, from the county for airport project that might not be there that, that is so so this plan can change the revenues can change the circumstances can change but all these numbers are, are parameters what goes within those parameters is up to the Macon County Board of Commissioners and that's what we're, we're discussing here today but what we do feel um, we've presented in, embodies the discussions of this board and the priorities that have emerged through discussions from this board and that's what we're uh, recommending so just a couple things just to follow up everything you said I can't speak to the actual projects I don't know but but everything you said everything else you said is, is, is accurate the projects the details like I said are in this appendix B C and D so that I know you just got it from me but that's something that you can study as y'all think about your priorities right um, and then uh, a couple other things Remember, we do have this annual allocation every year, right? So there's at least a million dollars for some of the smaller projects that may not be covered. And then there is some additional cushion within this plan. And the, the only dollars that we're looking at are the dollars currently dedicated to this capital funding plan that have been dedicated within your budget, right? To the extent there's budget growth outside, outside of the 1% restricted sales tax growth that we've assumed, outside of that growth, any other growth within your budget, tax base, sales tax, that's y'all's decision what you do with it, right? Um, you know, whether it's using it to offset current expenses or adding new capital projects or some combination of, of there, there may be additional dollars available in the future that you would choose to do that. No investment earnings, right? Um, even on these funds. And then kind of back to the first conversation we had on the fund balance, right? You gotta budget conservatively for a number of these levels. So just because you pull down your fund balance close to the target this year, close to that 40% target, you know, what we see a lot of folks do is this becomes an annual process, right? So next year, when Lori finishes up her audit, she'll look at her unassigned fund balance compared to your targets and say, here's where we were. And there is X million dollars or X hundred thousand dollars in excess of our policy. And by policy, we can use it on one-time expenditures. What would you like to do with that? And oftentimes, the answer is transferring it to the capital reserve, and we'll decide how to use that as part of the CIP process as part of the budget. So that's the goal, is to give you an achievable funding plan for the identified projects within the five years, but have some cushion, and hopefully have the ability to have some of those additional excess dollars in the future to address some of the projects that may not be within this first five years. Thank you. A couple, yes, of, year ago, a couple of years ago, we did a capital improvement plan proposed, and we excluded, we didn't include the schools into it. So with this allocation, this taking on this debt limit, that initially wipes out our existing yeah. That was the space needs analysis. Space needs yeah. and yeah, space needs and but that just kind of puts that on the back burner or we just I noticed one of those items in there was the senior center that was on our space needs. Yeah, and they actually in the, in the space needs uh, that was in the space needs analysis. And it's been part of our um, it was part of the CIP last year as well. Um, I think that price tag was a little different yeah, last year. The price tag last year was about this, but the prior year was this high. Right, right. <laughs> right so, now but, we've got but, this slotted in 2030. Pages what if, 28 and 29 gives you a good detail. Pages 28 and 29 of this book. You can see by fiscal year, and that's what Mitch was mentioning in Appendix B, you can see the proposed projects for this. Oh, okay, they're still free. Okay. And then, and then, like some of the schools John mentioned, like the Nana Hale wastewaters in there for 25, and then maybe, you know, put out in 2030, you see like the classroom additions for Park Park UJ East Front. Yeah, okay, again. So, well, and Lori does have this electronically as well. Yeah. I know it gets small, so yeah. if you need to zoom it in, she's I can cheap. email it to you. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, but 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 those are not funded as part of this five years, right? They're identified. They're in those future years as something that will need to be addressed. Um, but you know, the other thing that we kind of think about here too is is capital projects tend to evolve and priorities tend to evolve, right? And if you've got a 10-year CIP where all these projects are identified, funding capital for the next 10 years based upon where you are today is not, and that's going to be a much bigger impact, right? And there's going to be a lot that happens in the next 10 years. You would have never forecasted double-digit sales tax growth three years in a row, right? So this is kind of a, hey, here's the, here's, here's the five-year plan, and this can be funded, but we know we've got some other needs out there that we're gonna need, that we're gonna have to address. By the time 2030 comes around, who knows what revenues will be available, what grants will be available, right? I think when we started, I think the first analysis we looked at for the Franklin High School, excuse me, it had over like a, a 5%, over a five cent tax impact, right? So we didn't know that this grant wasn't even a thing at that point in time. Are you getting some water, mate? I thank you. So um, <clears throat> that's kind of the idea behind funding the five year. Thank you so much. Funding the five year, right, is, is it's more of a near term look and you'll evolve over the years. <clears throat> by the time it gets out to some of the later, these other future projects. <laughs> Excuse me. Take your break there. Here, bitch. Oh, Mr. I got four more of them up here. Thank you. <laughs> I have some gum as well if you like that. No, I'm good. I, well, these are fantastic. We like, can do a homelick on you. We can do a homelick. <laughs> I get to sit next to Dollar General. That's right. Walmart. He's got it on the <laughs> They're really good. Um, so that, that's kind of the idea. So they're identified. These other projects are out there. But you know, in prior years, we were identifying, hey, there's, a, there's an impact to funding these five years. We don't want to necessarily say, hey, you need to, in that scenario, which we're not in today, but we have, we're in the past, we don't want to suggest that you need to raise taxes by X to fund all of these projects, and you do that, right, in year one, to, which partly covers some projects that are out in year seven, eight, nine, ten. And by the time you get out to year seven, eight, nine, ten, there's, you wouldn't have ever needed that, right? So it's the idea of funding the near term and coming up with the dollars you need to fund some reasonable near-term amount of projects and then uh, continuing to evaluate future out-year projects as you get closer to actually funding them. It's trying to balance dedicating resources now and making sure you have resources available but not sort of requiring way too much now that may never be needed. Hey, like, like you're saying, Mitch, I think that's why it's important too to, to look at this at, like you say, the projects evolve, priorities change. But nonetheless, we see at the current state of affairs, we see the parameters of what we're capable of doing and, and the impact that that will have on our budget, regardless of what fills up the lines on those priorities. Um, we can see what we're capable of doing here. Yeah, and you know, as we go forward, the next couple of years, that senior center, depending on your priority, may start moving into that five-year CIP, and just like the high school, we may say, well, look, if you want to fund all of it now, we're showing you need X, X number of pennies, uh, a penny, a half a penny, whatever it is, to, to get that done, but you may not, you may not choose to do it at that point in time, and there may be another state community college bond that comes in and cuts that project amount in half, and you now you're able to cover it. It's a process, right? It's a planning process. That's what it is. Um, it doesn't mean you have to fund everything today. You're just making sure you're covered for this current year's funding, that's what's gonna make it into the budget, and then you've got a reasonable plan to address the next several years out to five years, and then next year we'll add another year to it, and add another year to it, and start doing that. 
So I, I'm telling you, I know it doesn't ne may not necessarily feel that way when you're saying we're going to spend 180 million dollars, but only half of it's yours, and um, and, and you're able to do it. Yeah, it, it's it, a max. Yeah, and, and, and you're able to do it without anything more than the resources you currently have dedicated to capital. That's that's an enviable position. A lot of people are not in that position. So. Um, from my perspective, it, this is an easy presentation to give. Um, there's others that are harder when you're looking at, well, if you really want to do everything you got to do, it's maybe double digit tax increase, right? Help, help me with that quarter cent, and I hate to bring it back up. No. How does that play into this scenario? Yeah, no, we left it there for a reason, right? Um, it out and left it in. It to be, no, we left the column there for a reason, right? It wasn't approved, right? Yeah, exactly. We don't have it, but you have the ability to put it back on the ballot. I mean, can and, we reduce? Our millage rate, if we get that quarter cent, I mean, would that be kind of recommended approach, or do you think? I, I mean, that, that, that's up to you all, right? Like, so let's say you get the quarter cent sales tax, when, like November 25, right? Or whatever. Even years. Yeah, November 26. You get the quarter cent sales tax, right? Well, at that point in time, there's a new revenue stream coming in. What are you going to use it for? Right? Is it, are you dedicating to schools? Are you dedicating to community college? Are you doing it for capital generally for the county, um, or is it just a quarter cent sales tax that can be used for anything? In that case, you know, you, it's your decision, right? You know, reduce the millage rate, uh, be able to fund some of these future year capital projects. Um, you know, fund a new initiative, fund some new positions, fund uh, paying class study for, for employees, whatever it may be. That's your, that's your decision, but you do, you will have, typically what people do is, like you all did the first time, is you say, we're going to vote the course in sales tax and we're going to use it for this purpose or these collective purposes, that tends to be the most successful approach at it. And that'll partially drive what you're able to do. I mean, in this case, right, you're transferring $2 million from the general fund. Is that what it translates to? Quarter cent? Yeah. Annually, what does it translate to? It's about 2.5 million. I, I have one of these footnotes. The last time we looked at it, yes. it it's no. Note three, note five, right? Mm -hmm. uh, last time we looked at it, it was estimated to generate uh, about 2.4 million, right? I mean, that's the point I'm trying to make. If our mill rate right now is, what, 1.25 pennies, if we get the quarter cent, we could essentially drop our mill rate by two mils. Am I wrong in saying that? No. Your, your penny generates 1.25 so like million. Me, like right now, I feel like some of us are running for re-election. I think that's a strong point to make the people that we could collect the funds from pass-through revenue and offset our local mill rate by two cents and keep all of our CIP fully funded. Yeah, I mean, look, right? The nature of your economy really supports that, right? I mean, by with the sales tax, yes, you all who live here um, will have to pay that quarter cent sales tax on which you buy, but you're getting the advantage of myself coming through and right. seeing y'all, people coming in playing golf, people coming in for the spa, all of that, right? All the people moving in for the summer. <laughs> um, 441. Those are dollars that you're getting um, from those people who are not necessarily property tax owners, who are not paying the property tax, but you're able to capture some more of that to go towards and these projects. That could go on the ballot. Or go towards your budget. 24. It could be yeah. good on the ballot. No, I've, been, like, I've been asked about it numerous times, and I feel like, I mean, if it's presented in a certain manner, I, I, I would support that. We'll get that on the agenda to, to, for the board to, to consider bring it putting it back yeah. on the ballot. But we have to see. We have to do it with June, though, right? In June. We have to make that request. Uh, that. I'm going to get with the board of election. I'll get with the board of elections. Gosh, y'all! I took up like all as long of, as you all of your retreat. Retreat. you're giving us. You stand up there as long as you want to. <laughs> Mitch, I know I don't say a whole lot to you, but I, man, thank you so much for like the details that you give us on this. So it is yes, appreciated, man. Well, good. Well, yeah, any follow-ups, like, obviously, Derek, Lori, you know how to get in touch with me and happy to answer anything. And depending upon where y'all end up, where you decide, you know, we'll look at alternative approaches and find the best thing that you all choose to do.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Mitch. Mr. Chairman, I'll take a five minute break. No way. Huh? <laughs> I'm sure you have. You, have you got break. your defense on? I don't know. <laughs>